Hi, I'm Dimitri Moraitis, and you're on Awaken Nation with Brad Zalas. A huge shift is taking place on planet Earth. People seem to be waking up, tired of the way things used to be. They are creating something brand new and changing the world we live in. My name is Brad Zalas, and I get to sit down with the next generation of idea makers. The disruptors and the game changers. Everyday people, just like you and me, from all over, who are doing amazing things. Welcome to Awakened Nation. Dimitri, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, you're in for an amazing treat here today because uh, we're going to be talking about spirituality, <clears throat> Christ consciousness, reincarnation, uh, awakening, all these cool things that we like to talk about here on Awakened Nation. Um, and uh, I'm excited, man. Welcome to the show. All right. All right. Well, it sounds like you're doing some really interesting things yourself. <laughs> Trying to, you know, I'm paddling upstream over here. Uh, <laughs> let me let me open up a little bit about this uh, author, teacher, speaker, and co-founder of the Spiritual Arts Institute, Dimitri Moraitis is helping us tap into our divine guidance to help us release what may be blocking greater happiness in our lives. And this is a great quote. I love this. There is an evolution of consciousness through which a person can achieve higher states of awareness. Uh, love that quote from you. And you also have your podcast, The Next Level Soul Podcast. Uh, Dimitri, welcome to the show. Well, thank you again. Thank you again. Yeah, it's... um. You know, I've been on the spiritual journey for a long time now. <clears throat> I originally started to be uh, in uh, an artist. I was a musician and filmmaker, and I thought that was going to be my road. But I started having these, I, originally I was calling them sort of inspiration moments because I didn't know what metaphysics was at that time. <clears throat> and then it was so strong, I had my spiritual awakening. And once I realized it was metaphysics, I couldn't get enough of it. And shortly after that, I was very fortunate. I met Barbara Martin, who became my spiritual teacher. She's a generation older than me. And the first night I met her, I realized this is the one I need to be studying with. But I didn't realize at the time we were going to start an organization together. We were going to be <laughs> writing together and doing all these things we've been doing together. Yeah. So it's been a marvelous journey. Um, and it, it's, there's, you know, really, I, I'm not saying this as a platitude, but there's never been a better time to grow spiritually than today. There are more people interested in the mystical life than ever before. Yeah. And this is a great time to jump into those waters. I agree with you. You know, there's an ancient Chinese proverb that's actually a curse, but it says, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> and, and I always laugh. I always laugh at that one because plain and simply uh, it's, we are in interesting times. Yeah. And I like to always say this to people, wherever there's great strife or evil or whatever, there must be an equal amount of spiritual enfoldment or, you know, higher consciousness simply because we are in a world of duality right now. Polarity, opposites. You can't have light unless you have dark. You can't have good unless you have bad. You can't have love unless you have, you know, uh I'd say hate, but that's not the opposite of love. <laughs> right, right. Oh, you <laughs> it's indifference. Right, the opposite right. of love. <laughs> the opposite of love is indifference, indifference. actually. Right, right, right. right. So um, I wanted to start with you because spiritual awakening doesn't happen overnight. Uh, now, some people it has. They they have a near death experience and suddenly. But how how did you start waking up? Like me, I'm also an artist, graphic designer, painter. Mm. Love to draw. I was a sensitive kid very empathic. And I think that is the boiling pot or the milieu, to use a French word, of, of what it takes to suddenly be maybe the first one in your family to wake up. Well, the interesting thing, because as an artist, you are already kind of trying to tune into the ineffable, to the right. thing you can't put your finger on. Why does that piece of music sound beautiful and this one not as much? You know, structurally, they could be fine, but there's an inspiration. So I was in that mode already. Uh, what I tell people, though, is, you know, you don't you can't awaken yourself. You are awakened is the thing. Now, that can happen over time or it can be dramatic. And in my case, I do call it my Saul in the road to Damascus moment because it was more on the dramatic side. But that's not true for everybody. But the key is 
that's the divine knocking on your door. And if you've had that awakening, you're supposed to do something about it. You're supposed to, you know, the door is knocked, you're supposed to open it. And this amazing world is going to kind of unfold for you. For some that has not yet happened, you know, the awakening has not yet happened. And you've got to let them be where they are. You may have loved ones and family that have not awakened, but you have. And you must pursue the road, love them all the more. But as Shakespeare said, be true to thyself and you cannot be false to anyone. So that's the main key right now. Um, and the other thing also to remember is we're, we're not doing this journey by ourselves. This, uh, there, there is an invisible world. There is a spiritual world from where everything physical you know, was born from. And we are not physical in our essence. We are spiritual in our essence. As yeah. Teliyar de Shadan said, we're not you know, physical beings. Have, we're not humans having a spiritual experience. We're spiritual beings having a human experience experience so what you want to do is when you've had that glimmer the awakening is a glimmer of this more infinite life and it's supposed to be okay we gave you the taste now you've got to start to pursue the path uh, max heindel called that the path of initiation the accelerate we call it the accelerated path where you have more opportunities to grow maybe than ever before as master yoda said <laughs> In the Empire Strike Back, strikes back. Uh, not this crude material, are we? Yeah. Uh, uh, I I like to say it like this: We're kind of like a diver going into the depths of the ocean, but we have to wear this special suit, you know, that we call the meat right. suit. And um, when you fall asleep at night and you're dreaming, that's actually the real world. And this physical world that we come back to in the morning. When we wake up groggy and upset, um, you, that's that's the temporary. And I've always found this fascinating when people, I think a lot of us do this, Dimitri. Uh, we see this as the permanent world when it's not. This is the illusory world and it will end someday. But it's amazing how many people uh, and I'm not doing this to compare. I'm just saying it's amazing how much we may have forgotten that we are soul. We are a spiritual being. We are a piece of the divine of God. If you want to go down that road, um, just cut off from God and placed here, almost like going to the ocean and getting a cup of water from the ocean and walking away from it. That's still part of the ocean. And that's, I believe, who we are as soul. We're a piece of that divine in this body that allows us to operate here on earth right 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 but we also have to remember the soul is growing mm. the reason we're here is not because we made a mistake we may have karma we all that's another subject we can get into but the primary reason we're here is this is evolution so you made a great thing about the diver you know in the, in the depths of the water you can also think of it like a seed planted in the ground it's planted in darkness yeah. right and it's it germinates in darkness and it starts growing in darkness it doesn't break through the ground right away but yet it seems to know oh i gotta move up if i want to become that you know that beautiful oak tree so we're kind of like our body is the temple of the soul it's not a bad thing the, some people think well gosh if i'm not real my body then the body's a, a terrible thing no no not at all we need like you said the body to get around but the Hindus give a great example of what you just said. When you look at the physical world through your five physical senses, and you say that's all there is, there's nothing else, we're just a bunch of atoms bouncing around the universe, that's an illusion. Not that the world doesn't exist. Of course the world exists. But it's kind of like if you're only looking at this band, you know, like the electromagnetic spectrum, even the visible light band we know is just a fraction of the whole spectrum. So what we have to do is widen the spectrum. We have to break the veil between the physical material world while we're in the body. Yogananda said the goal is, uh, the Hindu mystic, the goal is to see God face to face while in a physical body. Now, he didn't mean literal face to face, but to have that God presence. And that takes effort. You have to pursue that path to kind of break through the veil to be, as the Bible says, in this world, but not of this world. 
Right. And when we don't see that spiritual, it's exactly as you say, we end up identifying with it. Well, I see my body, I'm seeing you, I'm seeing the environment I'm in here, so this is what it is. You know, not realizing, well, it's a piece of what it is, but it's not the full picture. Mind blown. Yeah. <laughs> and the hitters <laughs> can't carry it further. I'm sorry, when they say the goal is to break the illusion, right? Right. And to reap the moshka, moshka the, the enlightenment. And they do it exactly the description you said. We're like the drop. You're trying to reach Brahman, which is the ocean of life. And when you come to the realization of who you really are, you break the illusionary veil. You can return to the ocean like a drop returning back to the ocean. Right. Well, I grew up Catholic and Christian. <clears throat> I grew up and I, What's that? <laughs> I What's grew up that? Orthodox. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so what happened is I was always taught growing up, you could never really experience experience God until you died. Right. And I never sat well with that. Because if you read the Bible, you read the Torah, whatever, those men and women of the Bible, they created a very in-depth, direct connection. Exactly. with the creator a relationship exactly. so as a kid i couldn't buy that myth that i was being taught in catholic school that you can't you, you can pray to god but god's way over there in another um <laughs> in another municipality and the yeah. only way you're going to meet him is if you die and then you can move to that neighborhood and i i disagreed <laughs> you know i was one of those who got paddled in catholic school oh boy oh boy yeah because i asked questions and um, they did not like that, <laughs> but I would go in the backyard. I don't know what this was, but it was an intuitive thing. I'd look up at the stars and I would talk to God. That's how I prayed. Was... Um, and of course, like everybody else, I would ask for things, but at the same time, I felt that a mature relationship with God, the creator, whatever people call it, the universe, I felt a mature relationship was actually working with God for the betterment of me and the people around me that I felt I was serving. You know, it, oh, it was really... That's pretty you know, sophisticated for a kid. <laughs> well, you know, I got beat up for that. So yeah. just want to let you know, that was our generation. You know, if you said you were into Star Trek, you got beat up. So we didn't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, that was amongst our nerd friends. Um, and it was the same with love for God. You know, that I had a burning love for God. I could have become a priest if I wanted to. Wow. That's wow. that was part of it, but um, I God had other plans for me. But do you find this? You know, we're in a really great day and age, and I feel like everything that I just said got contradicted. Now people are seekers, they're right. active seekers right. looking for the deep relationship with God without an intermediary. Well, the point is, the days of, I'm so glad you brought up those. So the days of the prophets are not numbered. Right. You know, there is no book, no matter how sacred, no matter how holy, that can contain God. It can be inspired, but there's always going to be, you know, prophet literally mean one, one who knows. And like you said, they were examples. Even the, the Christ said, you know, all these things you will do and more. They were supposed to be examples, not exceptions to the rule that we ourselves can do exactly what you said, build a more direct connection. And this time is not only a more direct connection, but a more mature understanding of God to understand more what God really is. And we're, we are talking about the infinite here, right? This is a huge topic. This is not like a, oh, okay, this is, you know, a, a checklist of many other things I'm going to be studying. You know? I, I like pie. Let's get some pie. Yeah. It's a yeah, little yeah, deeper than yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, this is a time to develop a more mature understanding of God and develop. Now, I, I love Pyth uh, Pythagoras, the ancient Greek mystic and, and, and mathematician. When he was teaching mysticism, he said, okay, let's be, okay, the prophet is the one who knows, but let's be a little more modest. Let's say we're going to be the ones who seek to know, and that's his definition of a philosopher. So in a sense, all of us on the spiritual path are philosophers because we're seeking to know the truth, the truth about right. life, the truth about God, not by what someone teaches us necessarily, although we will have teachers along the way, but in the end, like you just did in the backyard as a kid, 
through your own direct communication. All of them had that. And we're all meant to have that. Now, sometimes you do need a teacher. You know, Barbara's teacher mentor would say, well, the role of the physical based teacher is to act as an emissary for the divine until the student can reach that place for themselves. So that's the idea of the guru chela relationship and things like that. Yeah. They're an, they're, they're an intermediary, but we have to do our own growing. No, anyone says, you know, enlightenment, five easy steps, or, oh, I'll wave the wand and all your troubles have, are banished. You know, you run the other way. You don't, they don't know what they're talking about. They're trying to con you. <laughs> uh, you brought up a couple of terms. I'm just going to explain to the audience. Uh, whenever you say chila or chela, that is nothing more than a Padawan, our student, as we say. Oh, you're, you're doing star, you're star, star. We're going to keep that theme going. Uh, <laughs> although I'm a bigger Star Trek fan, um, there has always been a master Padawan uh, or master student, master Chila uh, relationship throughout the ages. And sometimes that relationship wasn't verbal. It was just being in the presence of the master. And we're not using the master as someone above you, just someone who's gone further sooner than you. So it's really, you know, they're, they're walking the path with you just as they did maybe, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, and I love what you're saying about this, by the way, I love your intro video at the, um, spiritual, oh, the, uh, yeah, yeah. spiritual arts Institute. Did I get that right? Yes. Spiritual Arts Institute. I want to play that video right now. Roll the oh, tape. Wow. The physical universe was born of the spiritual world. The divine is everywhere. Through the study of metaphysics, we can develop conscious awareness of our inner mystical self, evoking the power to feel stronger, confident, and centered. Expressing the love that celebrates community and propels creativity. Welcome to Spiritual Arts Institute, the premier metaphysical school for the aura, healing, and spiritual growth. Founded on the Kingdom of Light teachings, a 4,000-year mystical tradition the Institute offers certification programs to students around the world, in person, online, and across all media. The Institute's programs are developed by the inspired teachings of co-founders Barbara Martin and Dimitri Moraitis. Over five decades, Barbara's clairvoyant experiences have unveiled the mysteries at the very heart of metaphysics revealing the spiritual blueprint that surrounds all living things, your aura. Everything we think, feel, and do radiates a spiritual energy that comes through in different colors, shapes, and hues. This is the vibratory essence of existence. By changing the quality of your aura, you will change the quality of your life, discover your destiny, and fulfill your potential. We are at the dawn of a great spiritual awakening. Together, let us embrace it. I love what you're doing over there at the Spiritual Arts Institute. You want to, uh, you you woke up, you started doing this work, but you, like you said, you didn't expect to be doing this work with her. So oh. let's talk about how that happened. How did that yeah. come about? You're you're waking up and suddenly she's like, "Hey, you want to go into business together?" Is that yeah, how yeah. No, that was that was a little wild. Um, so actually, things were going pretty well at the time. You know, in terms of building my film career, I moved to L.A. to do it, Los Angeles. And after my awakening, then I started working with Barbara. Again, it was it was a dramatic, when I say my soul on the road to Damascus moment, it was dramatic. It was like, you know, meeting the love of your life. It, it, you, you, you suddenly, it started to consume me in a way. And I realized pretty soon that film, as much as I love it, 
and music I will love forever. I don't think it, you know, I started to realize, oh, this is what I've been looking for. So now I was writing, Barbara was writing. She came to me and said, well, let's start writing together. I said, I, you know, I don't, I've never written anything spiritual. And she gave the best advice ever that I will give to anybody when they hesitate a new adventure. She simply said, just start, you know, and I did. And it turned out we were really good writers together. You know, uh, I still though saw myself more in the entertainment and helping Barbara and her, you know, as a spiritual teacher, but I didn't realize she was grooming me to eventually teach. And after a while, just like you said, you know, sometimes when you're working with somebody, it's just inspirational. It's not like there were no books or notes or anything at the time, but we realized at some point, you know, we really got to, org there's so much here, we got to organize all this stuff. And that became the curriculum for the Institute. Then we started the nonprofit Spiritual Arts Institute and there now, then things started to really take off. And so we have sort of a system now of teaching, not really created by ourselves. It's really following an ancient tradition, but we've organized it a certain way. Yeah. I love that, you know, because um, true spiritual advancement, I've I've had that. And I, I had my, um, I was a seeker my whole life until mm -hmm. I got to New York City. And then oh, I... Wow. I wound up on an, a spiritual path called Ekinkar. And I had that dramatic moment happen to me where, you know, an Ek, an Ek master came to the foot of my bed and said, come with me, Psst, pulled me out of my body. And um, I had probably five very powerful dreams as if I was right there in the room that whole night. That was a deep awakening for me. Um, so I under, I completely understand what you're talking about when you talk about that, you know, on the road to Damascus moment where it's right. Like, so let's, let's get into this. You talk about the Christ consciousness. Um, and I saw this, maybe I should read some of this, but I like your take on it. This was really great. Christ consciousness is a term that refers to a spiritually evolved state of being. When we observe the life and message of Jesus Christ, we find the qualities of love, devotion, courage, and surrender at the center of his teachings and examples. The term Christ consciousness means a person's embodiment of such Christ-like qualities. Um, and you, you also talked about this, Christ consciousness awakens gradually, and it supports you throughout your spiritual growth. Let's talk about that. What is, it's, it's more than a feeling. It's a oh, state no, of consciousness. No, yeah, it's, a con it's a consciousness for sure. We all yeah. have it. Now, I, I hope people don't get tripped up on the word, you know, because we're not speaking of something denominational here. Right. Okay. This is not delegated to one religious belief system. Actually, Christ comes from the Greek word Christos, which means anointed, right? And that was also from the Hebrew for the idea of the Messiah, the coming right. one. Really, we're talking about an anointed consciousness. And this consciousness dwells in every person. The East, for a while, called it the Krishna consciousness. You know, the idea is, okay, if we're trying to have this ex experience of now, okay, you, you jumped into the deep end of the water here a little bit. <laughs> so, okay, if we're trying to do what Yogananda said, try to see God face to face in the physical body, we're not talking about shall we say, the throne of God, we're talking about what's known of as the God within, to know that God is. So that's already with us, but that experience is so exalted. Here we are in our human consciousness, here's this you know, experience beyond experience. You need a mediator. You need something in between that can take our human consciousness and help to bring it to the status where you can be in that God presence. And that's what the Christ consciousness does. It brings you into that. And the way to that consciousness, there's a lot you can do with meditation and prayer, but one of the key ways is truth. You want to know the truth about, you know, today the big thing is truth, right? What is truth? So, well, we, we talked about the world of illusion. Okay, so if I've got this veils and I'm living in an illusory world, I'm not really seeing the truth about things. So one by one, I've got to peel the layers away and seek truth in all things. 
because eventually each, yes, it may sting a little bit. Oh, I thought that person really liked me. But the truth is, no, not so much. You know, that's okay. It stung when I heard they didn't really like me that much, but then I got over it. Yeah. And then I'm seeing things more clearly. That helps to stimulate this Christ consciousness so that we can stand in the presence of the divine. Mm -hmm. Didn't anybody warn you before you came on the show, by the way? <laughs> or, that was going to be because no, then I, I would, then I I would go it. deep, you know. Yeah, I yeah. Gonna... Well, I, I, you know, um, again, it's having a discussion like this on a public platform is kind of miraculous. Let's face it. You know, yeah. it wasn't that long ago. You would have to have been in Ashram or a mystery school to talk like this. And here I, we are coming over the air. I agree with you. Because uh, here, here's what happened to me. You know, when I... When I went to New York City, I got exposed to everything from Scientology to the, the uh, I forget the name of the church, but it was, you know, all denominations were accepted. It was a Christ-based church, Jesus-based uh, church, and then wound up in Ekinkar. But <clears throat> as I was seeking, I kept asking myself inwardly, do these people get it? And so Scientology, I felt they were approaching spirituality from the outside in. Whereas I felt you, we really need to tackle spirituality from the inside out. Um, you know, we're, we're like in the cave, you know, as, as uh, they say in Greek mythology and also Gro Joseph Campbell, you know, the, the hero's journey, we, it starts within. And that means that connection with God. Um, but I'm somebody who, you know, in the eighties, I got a hold of an abridged edition of the bag of Gita. you know, that's where I was at. <laughs> You know, so, yeah, I know That's you're going to laugh at this. So when I when I heard you wanted to be on the show, I reached out and said, "Oh, yeah, yeah this is." And I listed off, I think, five or six things. The person was like, "What?" <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, I know those things. Um, I can. Are those your paintings behind you, by the way? No, not mine. But it's the artist um, that did the illustrations for our our latest book. It's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've noticed a lot of labeling going on lately <clears throat> and maybe we can address this, but I have friends that have had such deep and profound spiritual experiences. I'm scratching my head because they're, they still are entrenched in being an atheist. You know, this fascinates me. And then if you talk about love and light and raising vibration, I hear these hardcore Christians who are going, well, that's Luther Luciferianism or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we have Satanists who are coming out of the woodwork and proclaiming their, their pride days or whatever. Um, I, I look at it this way, your vibration, your love, what you're, you are opening your heart to, you have to have a lot of discernment in this day and age because you do get a lot of hucksters who are right. selling snake oil but at the same time, I believe the divine ability to raise our vibration is within each of us. And we it's our duty to find those teachings. It doesn't have to be a formal religion. It has to be your own doctrine, because as you raise your vibration, you're going to start to re realize, I've read the Bible since I was six years old in Catholic school. And I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, there's a lot of history there, a lot of discussions, but the secret teachings that Jesus gave directly to his apostles, where he taught them how to heal the sick, how to step out of the body. As Paul said, I went to the third heaven. Right. That means there's a third heaven and maybe higher. Whether that person was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. I mean, these, these are direct quotes. Uh, so I kind of have a tendency, what do you say to people who are like in these boxes? And yeah. it's just, it's really about waking up right now. Yeah. Yeah. I know that it's, you know, we're in this big melting pot time right now. Now I remember the first aura workshop I went to with Barbara, it was at a Catholic church and it was, um, in one of the community rooms and, you know, I was new to metaphysics then. So everyone was walking in and the priest happened to be there. He didn't know what was going on. He said, oh, there's an event here. What is this? Oh, this woman is talking on the aura. His face, I, I kid you not, turned beet red. Yeah. You could read his mind. Oh, my God, I've let the devil into my church. You know? <laughs> I know. <laughs> the feeling was so strong, right? And it was impressed me how strongly it felt. 
one of the things we say in our classes is I'm, we're not here to convince you of something. We're here to present to you. You're going to decide for yourself what's valuable. But what we do ask you to do is before you accept or reject, give it a space of time to try it out. It's it's like a science experiment, right? right. If you try to see how this element's going to work, you can't start mixing it with all this other stuff because you won't know what's going to happen. Give it some time. As you apply the principle, it, you will learn if it's good for you or not. Yes, there are false prophets in the world. You're absolutely correct. There are sinister forces at work. I hate to say it, just like in anything. All we have to do is look at the physical world to know right. you lock your car, you lock your house. You know, you do obvious things to protect yourself. It's the same spiritually. However, um, you know, there's that saying, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. So you are going to attract someone according to where you are. If you're looking to, oh, I want to feel good about myself, or I want to feel better than somebody else. You know, if you have ulterior motives of why you're jumping into a spiritual study, yeah, you might fall prey. Barbara has some very chilling stories of experiences with false prophets, including one of her students that was part of the Jim Jones mess, remember, years ago. Yeah, that's that's a chilling story, right? Um, but use your own there's that search for truth use your own discernment you know you're in the driver's seat of this there's a saying you know nothing can enter your aura unless somewhere you're permitting that to happen so True. you do have to be careful what you're choosing a lot of people say hey i am the way you know uh we were years ago when our first book came out we went to a big you know what do we call it uh, expo and everything i met one of the big distributors in the country and we were so happy with our book and he said yeah yeah you're one of 400 titles on metaphysics that just came out this month you know that's a bucket of cold water but then i asked yeah. him how many of those are staying on the shelf and he said not even 10 percent." so there's a lot of barkers out there but not a lot of the real stuff and it's your job to cull through what is the fool's gold and what is the real gold yeah I just uh, lost a friend recently because he's one of these dogmatic Christians and I see myself differently. I, I see that Christ Jesus and his apostles were very spiritual warriors, you know, so they had to be in balance with, you know, there's a passage in the Bible where they came back and they had found swords, you know, they were freedom fighters uh, for the Jewish cause at that time, because, you know, Rome dominated Israel, you know, at that time, or, you know, what later became, uh, you know, they were the Canaanites at one point. So you could see that there was this teaching in there that we were missing. You could see that these people were listening to his training, um, you know, and I feel that in this day and age, unfortunately, my friend, because I have healers around me and people who can talk, talk to the dead or whatever, He's lumped all this into Madame right. Blavatsky and Aleister Crowley and won't talk to me. And I find this um, just, I'm not heard. I'm just, I, I expected yeah, more uh, from a seeker who is, has delved into the esoteric his entire life. But this is too much for him um, because well, he's I would there. never put he, Aleister Crowley in the same with Alice Bailey that right there. I mean, with the, uh, uh, Helena Blavatsky, they're two completely. But the thing is, you know, one thing you might recommend, there's a lot of good scholarship study at the time of the Bible. And one of the things that has actually been discovered now, especially with the Nagamati Library and the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that, is at the time of the Jesus and the movement after it, there was more than one belief, more than one, shall we call, Christian practice. Yes, it wasn't set, it didn't get set in stone for 400 years, you know, so a lot can happen. Imagine you and I are talking now, how would we talk 400 years from now, right? So this, that's a lot of time to, yes. to go over there. So to realize, and a lot of it was around the idea of who Jesus was, what even really was. Some said he was a prophet, some said he wasn't even human, some said he was human, but he was not the Christ. Those were a different being. The other said he was human and the Christ. Right. We know which one won the day, but to try to understand that there was a lot of, and even there wasn't even one type of Jewish practice in those days. 
the rabbinical Judaism that we is today was not what was going on at the time of Jesus. That was right. part of the Pharisaic study. But there was the temple priests, there was the Essenes, there was the Zealots, and yes, the Zealots were the one, you know, let's let's get the Romans with swords. And they led they led Jerusalem into destruction, right? Yes. So, um so that might help, but you know, the challenge is when someone is very deep into an indoctrination. It's like they're hypnotized, you know. I, mean, I, I say this with love, but you're not going to. My experience is you're not going to change them, and yeah. and the goal is just to love them, not even try to change them. You know, uh, Barbara's teacher uh, Inez said, you know, my parents were very strong Methodists. I never once tried to change their belief system. This was a very high advanced mystic, right? She just knew it wasn't their time. You know, yeah. I know it's it sometimes, especially people you care about, you want them to be kind of be able to share sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but what you want to reach out are to those yeah. you know when i had my awakening I, yeah just about everybody around me thought it was nuts right <laughs> you know i just lost it right yeah. so i really had to cultivate sort of other friends you know that were yeah you know. i'm glad you said that uh but there what you said at the end i had a business partner who he thought i was just nuts but We'd go out, you know, and have our, our business luncheons or end of the week get togethers. And it would take four beers for, <laughs> for him to turn to me and he goes, I believe I get in touch with God when I'm standing on top of a mountain and the sun is setting. And I'm like, eh. <laughs> and I was like, all right, you, we need to cut you off. No more drinking. <laughs> And for some people, I feel that is that that thick skin that, you know, we we grow up with when we're unaware, you know, especially men. I think we, we have a tendency to not travel inward to those emotional states. But as an artist, uh, you don't have a choice. If you want to be greater at your craft, if you want to be better, exactly. you have to go to the heart. And that awakens the right brain, which if you uh, watched uh, the, the TED Talk with... Uh, I forget her name, uh, Bolt Taylor, <clears throat> Bolt A. Taylor. She talks about when she had a uh, uh, a stroke, her whole left brain went away. Oh, gosh. Gone. And all she had was the right brain. And when she described that, she says, now I could feel the universe. I thought, whoa. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was from the tertiary field of the heart because her left brain was gone. Wow. And a very, very powerful. It's interesting you say like the, uh, the, the great majority of our students are female. And it's kind of always been that way. Um, maybe it is because, like you say, the men are taught to be strong in their intellect. And the thing so is, we, we, yeah, you do need to be intellectual, but you want to lead with inspiration, not intellect. Intellect's the processing part. It's not the inspirational part. And if you want to be actually a better artist or a better in your spiritual, yes, yeah, sometimes I see people very smart, but in metaphysics, they throw their intelligence out the window. So, well, why are you believing all this crazy stuff? You know, and that was crazy what they were believing. Um, you want to use the rational mind. You know, Socrates kept challenging people. Well, why do you think that way? Well, what, what, you know, they, you want to unravel the pieces, but you've got to let that inspired part of you because the goal is to live a more inspired life. You said in your own awakening, you went up a couple notches in your <laughs> IQ. Well, that happens because what really is genius, right? Yeah. Genius is, it's a couple of things, but it's its its that ability to tap into the higher system more systematically. And then also having the craft to be able to hone it, to be able to utilize it. Right. Yeah. I want to, I have to say this because on the recording, but the Ted talk I was talking about is um, Jill Bolte Taylor. She had a stroke and the reason she became a brain doctor is because her brother suffered from schizophrenia and she went through a stroke and describes it in such detail and how I've actually had people reach out to me and say, now I understand God because of that Ted talk, wow. which I thought was interesting. Wow. Um, getting back to what we were talking about, uh, we are really in a very, very powerful time right now because I feel the doors are opening 
during this, what we call the great awakening. Mm -hmm. And people are beginning to understand that a lot of the esoteric knowledge has been kept from them, number one. And number two, you talked about really, really intelligent people, sometimes people with PhDs and much higher learning than you and I, they actually can't see certain things. Um, I liken it to uh, Paul Giamatti in uh, Field of Dreams. He's screaming at Kevin Costner. Yeah, I guess he was his banker or something. He goes, why are you building this? You're in debt. You know, you're, you're thousands of dollars. And he's screaming and yelling until that, that I think it was that uh, little girl starts choking on a hot dog and he's down there panicking and, you know, he's helping her. And finally she lives and he's like, Oh, Oh, and he looks up and now all of a sudden he can see all the baseball players on the field that he couldn't see before. Oh yeah. And yeah. he was like, what, when did these people get here? And the, everybody looked at him and just smiled that <laughs> wonderful smile of knowingness and saying, brother, welcome aboard. And that, that ability to trust, that ability to know that everything's going to work out. And as the camera pulls away at the end of the movie, you see one car right, after another right, right, lined right. up, uh, build it, and they will come. Right. right. Now you need marketing. That's become now uh, <laughs> fixed into the, the, the world psyche, build it, and they will come. <laughs> yeah, it really is part of the zeitgeist. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about this, because I had Dr. Joe Vitale on from The Secret. And we talked about this, this flip that takes place now, you know, it used to be, you know, I'll see it when I believe it. And now if you believe it, you'll see it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Well, you are where you place your attention, you know? Um, so if your attention is on X, Y, and Z, that's all you're going to see. Now, I think even belief, though, has to have some kernel of experience to start that. You know, if I had met Barbara a year earlier before my awakening, I, I would not have recognized her as my teacher. I would say, oh, this is an interesting woman. We did an interesting meditation, but I don't think I would have said, boy, I've got to study with her. So there's sort of a timing for things in our life, you know. And one of the things I also share as well, you know, I had a very good life in Chicago where I was raised. I could easily have settled down there. But something said, no, go to Los Angeles to pursue movies. Actually, I was in New York, too. I went to NYU. What an interesting city nice. to have your awakening in. It's a very fast-paced city. <laughs> I lived there for 35 years. Oh That's my God. Where, I, where in Manhattan did you live? Everywhere. I lived in Brooklyn, Queens, uh, Staten Island, Manhattan. I lived everywhere but the Bronx. The Bronx. Uh, and yeah. believe it or not, that's where my spiritual awakening took place starting in the 80s. I, I went to every, you know, I went to yoga centers, new life expos, wow. uh, you know, the the yeah, churches, everything, you name it. I was looking for God in all the wrong places. Um, um, I, you know, what like the place to have you waking in the midst of all this activity? Because New York, I always tell people, even if you never, you, everyone should experience New York in their life because there's just nothing like yeah. it. Yeah. Just the, the energy of the place is, is very unique. It's um, true. Yeah, yeah. But in a way, there's a, you know, I know these sound again like, like cliches, but if you follow your bliss, if you follow what's important to you, but also realize this may not be the end of the journey. I went to LA thinking I was going to build a life in entertainment, and I found my spiritual life there. So follow the road where you need to do it. But there's going to be many times where you are going to have to act on faith. You know, and the Bible says faith is giving substance the things not yet seen. So if you are not willing to put yourself on the line for what you believe, you're not going to get very far in your life. You're going to be in this stuck kind of stuck mode. I think that, you know, when a person goes to LA and they're fixated on becoming a Hollywood legend, it's, it really takes courage and the warrior inside of you to say, wait a minute, all these things that are coming at me are really not telling me to go down the road I think I want, there's a bigger path over here. And I uh, let's talk about that because, you know, how many times have I gotten hit in the back of the head with God trying to tell me something, spirit trying to wake me up, and I realize on the third hit, 
It's been going on for nine times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Finally, it, it made it. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing about Los Angeles is, first of all, there was a period where it was kind of a center for spiritual activity. You know, a lot of the oh yeah mystics went there. So the, it was very different, say, the, the feeling of Chicago. Chicago to me was more like a big little town. L.A. had a lot of different energies. And again, because of this creative, you know, the ineffable was celebrated. Now, there's a lot of fly-by-nights there, you know, and they're only, like you say, interested in their careers. And right. they're, you know, so there's a lot of fluff in that town, as they call it that. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to get lost in all that fluff. Um, but for some reason, in the midst of all that, it, it created the environment I needed for what was going to be the next the next step. And also, Barbara lived in Los Angeles at the time. I wouldn't have met her as a teacher. So, you know, how do you know what brings people and situations together? I'm I'm amazed at the divine how they're able to. I guess they have to use this a little bit, like move the pawns on the chess table. You know, <laughs> okay, let's get them over here. Let's get her over there. Let's get this. You know, suddenly, maybe they'll they'll see each other. <laughs> yeah. I always find that fascinating because, you know, I, I look back on my life where I've had extreme failures, <laughs> like uh, maybe I was fired from a job or let go because I didn't have the budget anymore. And I realized like a month or two before, I'd be like, you know, I'm going to stay here and just make as much money as I can and move on when I feel like it. And spirit goes, uh -uh. <laughs> we need you to go forth with courage. Go on, you know, and I'm like, what the, you know, and at first I used to resent it and then I began to embrace it because it's like the hero's, hero's journey. If right. you're reading your own book about your life, let's say at the end of your life and you read it as an adventure novel, you're going to be like, well, I'm John Carter from Mars, you know, right, <laughs> jumping right. here. I learned, I loved, I lost. Uh, it was beautiful. I pulled out the sword one day and fought for the week. And then I stood up and I made a dumb mistake over here, but it worked out, you know, and I feel that's how our lives are. You know, it's meant to gain an experience that someday on a higher plane, after you've left here, you tell that story around the campfire, you know? <laughs> well, but you're saying it very, if you think life more as an adventure where you are meant to, you know, even let's say, um, what uh, Manly Hall used to say as we get older, we tend to think of our life as a law of diminishing return. That is not true because life is eternal. If you get inspired at 60 or even 80 to do something, we're going to be doing things to our last day on earth. So yeah. you want to, now you don't want to do foolish things, of course, but even if you try and fail, it, as I say, it's better to not have tried at all. It's like saying it's better have loved than lost than never have loved at all. It's true. We have to try things. They, as you say, at the time, it may hurt. And you say, why did I get picked on or whatever? But in the end, we realize, boy, we learned a lot. And of course, they say failure today is sex to, uh, success tomorrow. Yeah, so it's the beginning of it. What you want to watch out for are the repeated mistakes. If you find yourself doing the same pattern over and over again, well, there's a lesson there. Why do I keep coming back to the same scenario? Yeah. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> what, me? Repeat patterns? No. <laughs> Never happened. Um, it's a Homer Simpson moment. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> How did that happen over that and a, over? Ooh, sprinkles. Um, <laughs> that was a good impersonation. <laughs> thank you. I used to do voiceover, so ah. people are always shocked. Uh, let's talk about reincarnation, because I'm one of these people... I knew I had re reincarnated when I was like three or four years old. I looked down at my body and I said, I'm white. And I wasn't happy with it. I felt I was in the body of the enemy. Oh my and God. I didn't know what the hell the word reincarnation was, let alone right. even guessed at it until I was maybe 17 or 18, maybe, maybe younger when mm -hmm. the TV show came on the reincarnation of Peter proud. Mm. Now, I've, I know that I've lived before. It isn't some sort of, you know, weird thing. Um, but I do know that those things have been removed from the Bible. There's a historical record of it. Right. Uh, but on top of it, I've noticed that if you bring up reincarnation, I've noticed a lot of Christian friends, they get vitrolically angry as if that's some sort of satanic lie or whatever. And I just look at them like, how, how is that evil? 
we've lived before. This is the lesson that brings us back to earth. As the late, great Robin Williams said, um, reincarnation is the cosmic credit card plan charge <laughs> now pay later. You're forced to come back here and live in the same hell you created for someone else years ago, yeah. or even worse. Here's what the karma really is. Things are going to come into your life until you realize you did that to other people in the past. And once you get the lesson that it doesn't mean it goes away. So let's, let's talk a little yeah, bit about you know, well, this would be a whole uh, show all by itself, but um, basically, you know, the first chapter in our latest book is you don't go to heaven. You grow to heaven. Okay, we've got to think this is an evolutionary process. The kindergartner doesn't go to postgraduate study in a year. Right. There are stages in between. There's no way we can accomplish everything in a single life. I don't care. You could be, you know, in first grade, get A++ on every grade, every test. Doesn't mean you're ready for college. Right. You're fantastic in second grade, right? Maybe you will skip a grade here or there. But there's a journey. So we come in to experience. We've got to experience being, you mentioned white. Well, we've got to experience all the races. We've got to yes. experience the sexes. We've been both male and female. We've got to experience different parts of the world. There's a lot to learn on this earth. When uh, Henry Ford, you know, the, the automaker adopted the theory, he said, when you, when you write this conversation, write it in a way to put people's minds at ease. Because when I learned about reincarnation, I realized there's time to create and there's always a second chance. There's no such thing as eternal damnation because you have the opportunity, even if you really mess it up, you have the opportunity. Yes, it may take a long time, but you'll have the opportunity to correct yourself, to correct, because we are basically good. We have to understand the soul is basically good. It's not evil. It's not like we may do evil things, but the life that is within us is inherently good. And eventually we're going to figure it out. And that yeah. reincarnation gives us the time to evolve over thinking like each lifetime is like a grade in school. And yes, during that life, sometimes we're earning credits, we're, <laughs> we're charging up the credit card, we're earning debits, you know. And yes, we all come in with unfinished business. You can think of this life like a chapter in your book of life. And you're wondering, well, like if you picked up a great novel and you just opened up to chapter 13, you might sort of orient yourself, but what happened here? Why is that person, you know, just like in our lives? Well, why was I born into this life? Why was I born into this situation? Why right. the story behind mm -hmm. all that? Yeah. It's very powerful to realize that reincarnation and karma, I look at it this way, God set up a system that works on its own. You know, all we have to do is evolve as soul. You know, that personality part of us as, as a child maybe, or as a teenager that thinks we know it all from the mind has to step into higher self, meaning soul. And you slowly create this deeper relationship with your higher self, which is soul, subconscious, and the personality. And you know, I, I, I always say this to people because they they approach everything with thought and the mind. I'm going to memorize the Bible. Okay, <clears throat> that's that's a good goal. It's a great goal, as a matter of fact. Um, but what can you envision? Can you feel yourself standing there with Moses um, as his kundalini opens so he can see flames around everything? Can you imagine yourself in those time periods and really get the lesson that's trying to be said to you? And I, I always say this to people, but consciousness is not about how, your IQ. Consciousness is not about how many books you've read or knowledge you entertain or your IQ. Consciousness is a particular type of awareness that is independent of your mind. In other words, it's not your thoughts, it's your existence. And soul is good. It's made directly from a tiny little speck of God. So soul you is the light body you, the energy that's inside this body. And that body is pure and loving. It's our job to let it through, to let it lead, 
to let us lead. We've been taught we're separate from soul. So therefore we talk in terms like I just did, which is, you know, my soul is going to lead things. No, I am soul. I just happen to have a physical body that's named Brad. Right. <laughs> you know, and soul life. is soul is something bigger. It's the divine spark in us. And it has one thing that nothing else on earth has. And that's the ability to be incredibly creative and bring that creative force to life right in front of us. We create the reality we live in. Am I right on that? Or am I? Yeah. Am I well, going I mean, we are end? also participating in a collective process that we weren't necessarily we've created, but of course you create your life. The, the decisions you made yesterday have brought you to where you are today. So if you're unhappy with your life, then, well, what, what kind of decisions did you make? And the decisions you're making now are going to create your tomorrow. So what is it you want to create now? You know? that's, it's, that's the scariest part for a lot of people because when you step into the world of spirituality, you will come to the real, uh, realization, and I don't want to say you, you know, forcing that conversation on you, but I discovered it becomes a path of self-responsibility, right. which is very hard for people to swallow that that person came into their life to destroy their life because you attracted it. That's probably the hardest thing for somebody to, to believe in. I had a friend who died of brain cancer, and I tried to explain to him your path, you attracted it so that you could grow, learn, and create this foundation that now serves a huge community. And he told me I was crazy. And then he died. He didn't get a chance to understand these events happened for us, not to us, as they say. It's a great conversation. I love this. How do we get a hold of you, by the way, Dimitri? Yeah, Where do we go? Um, well, we have the Institute, Spiritual Arts Institute, at spiritualarts.org. And we're a nonprofit. We do online classes. We're here in uh, San Diego area. If you happen to be near uh, Encinitas. And um, yeah, we have a lot of different courses, ongoing training, workshops and books. You can get, you know, bookstores and Amazon. I had Geraldina Rosco on the show. She has uh, the Bay, uh, the Bay Area meditation uh, nope. out there. Panache Desai, Dan Millman. Um, I love this kind of work. Because I do believe we're in the great awakening right now where people yeah. are seeing the illusion fall away. Uh, you know, all our institutions, you know, are naked now. People can see bare what's really going on, what has been going on probably for centuries, and we didn't notice. Right. right. And uh, I just love this. Uh, you know, I'm very honored you're on the show today. Um, I like those. So let's, let's go... Um, a little deeper into this. What do you recommend that someone does to start to solidify this awakening that takes place, this, this seeker mentality? Um, could you explain that for us? Well, the most important thing is to pursue it. It's not accidental. So if you've had your awakening, do your best to make your spiritual growth an even higher priority in your life. That's number one. And, you know, what do they say? Seek and you will find. So look for things. Seek it out. See what you're looking for. There's different things you have to do for yourself. There's a whole process involved. Again, this is like, you know, metaphysics is like learning a language or all the languages. And it, it, it's going to take all of you to really embrace. And it will take time. You know, you don't learn a language overnight. You don't learn to play the piano overnight. So you can start on the journey, but our our strongest recommendation is to start pursuing it. Yeah. And I feel, folks, if you're afraid or whatever, just keep Jesus in your heart. If, if that's what you're comfortable with, stay with that. But we're looking for the secret teachings that were given to the apostles. They're not in the Bible, okay? This is the way to step into it because those teachings were removed. And I, th I think it's our duty, actually, to awaken to this, our soul body, who we truly are, and uh, step out into a bigger, broader world. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for being oh, on Awakened Nation. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate all that you're doing, too. Thank you.
So I'm not going to let you go that easy. <laughs> I do a lightning round <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> where I ask questions. Um, and uh, this is where we get to know you a little bit better uh, outside of, uh, you know, Spiritual Arts Institute. So let me ask you my first question. And I always love this question. Um, what's your favorite memory? Oh, gosh. I have a lot of good memories. <laughs> That's one you always go back to. That's that's probably yeah. The best. I don't know. I have a lot of good. I've had some good times in my life. Um, I don't know if I can think of one, but but certainly the the awakening and the realization is a very. I always remember that is a very sacred memory. Let's call it that. Do you have a moment where um, you saw a student wake up and you were just like, "Wow!" It like blew oh, your yeah. mind. Well, I mean, they were awakened, but we're. I mean, any teacher will say when you find a student is un not because that's what you even said it, but they're just understanding the principle and the light bulb goes on. That's one of the most satisfying things any teacher could ask for because you say, okay, they got it. My second question is, what are you still really passionate about? Oh, well, first of all, I love music. So I love the art still. That's never gone away. And I'll have it for the rest of my life. Um, uh, the the work, the zeal for this work has only gotten stronger, you know, and now reaching out to more people. Yeah, I feel a little bit on a mission now to really get this out there. And I feel like I'm another stage of my life is opening up now along that road. Beautiful. And I guess my last question is, what really touches your heart um well i guess you could say love you know but you know i mean how do i put that into words when you're feeling the divine connection and when you're feeling also even you know a kind moment with somebody else or something where it's it's coming from the heart you know uh even if it's an animal it's coming from where it's just you know, it's that moment of eternity, if you want to call it that. Yeah. I love you, man. Yeah. You're real authentic and deep. Reach out to Dimitri, my friends. Um, go over to the Spiritual Arts Institute, spiritualarts.org. Go there. Um, we played some of their, their video here. Um, and the work you do. Dimitri, thank you so much for being on Awakened Nation, my friend. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Tune in next week. Until then, bye-bye. Thank you so much for being a big part of the Awakened Nation movement. This is how you can help me and our extraordinary guests. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let's grow this movement by word of mouth. Our success will be because of you. Thank you, and see you next week.